चेक करना यूट्यूब पे आ रहा है यूट्यूब पे आ रहा है चेक कर यूट्यूब यूट्यूब Good afternoon, everyone. My topic for today's seminar is cephalometric diagnosis for functional appliance case. Uh, these are the contents under which my seminars will be uh, going through. The first is introduction, cephalometrics, uh, functional analysis, case discussion, conclusion, and references. So, starting with introduction, uh, irrespective of the uh, any appliance given, uh, there is a need for uh, irrespective of the any appliance given, there is a need for cephalometric analysis. That helps in uh, planning the treatment plan according to the patients. Uh, talking about mixed dentition, they come with a different challenge that uh, the mixed dentition uh, provide uh, different uh, growth patterns uh, and different uh, amount, direction, and position of incisors vary according to individual to individual. And the same criteria cannot be applied for adult dentition as well because each group has its own demand and certain objectives need to be achieved. So uh, maximum uh, amount of growth occurs during the pre-pubertal period. Uh, specifically after nine years, there is alteration in the direction of growth. It can be average, it can be horizontal or vertical. But in most of the cases, it is horizontal uh, followed by average and vertical. So uh, talking about the growth, uh, it's the uh, amount of growth uh, that is one of the important factors uh, because uh, amount of growth can be low, medium and high. Uh, so a high amount of growth is usually beneficial in functional appliance therapy. Uh, second thing is the direction of growth, uh, whether it is horizontal or vertical, and accordingly, uh, what are the uh, favorable chances for the functional appliance. The last thing is the position of incisors. Uh, since maxillary incisors are almost stable in relationship to the palatal plane, but uh, due to the growth in the mandible, the basal growth in the mandible, there is axial relationship between maxilla and mandible incisors that can change. Uh, hence, uh, that becomes a, another important factor for uh, analyzing the treatment plan. So this growth is basically uh, the factors that can be checked for this is variability of, this, uh, of the growth pattern. And the second thing that uh, we should have the ability to forecast the pattern of growth how this growth will uh, going further in the individual. So why there's a need of cephalometry then? Uh, cephalometry enables the localization for the anomaly. It helps us the differentiation between skeletal and dental alveolar malocclusions. Uh, it determines the primary and secondary dysplastic structures. And it also shows the possible compensation that occurs before the uh, uh, commencement of treatment. So uh, before moving on the uh, uh, cephalometric part, it is also important to know the etiology and what are the treatment uh, possi uh, tri therapeutic uh, possibilities available. Uh, available. So I just like to take the example of open bite. Uh, open bite can be uh, uh, caused due to two causes. One, it can be either skeletally derived or it can, it can be neuromuscular dysfunction. When the open bite is caused due to skeletally derived, uh, we need to understand that the, uh, in which stage the child is. Uh, is growth is still yet to accomplish, then in that cases, we can uh, channel the basal bone and thus uh, treat the skeletally derived open bite. Or once the growth is completed, uh, we can go for compensatory treatment option. Whereas neuromuscular dysfunction, which is mainly a dental alveolar origin, uh, they, in that, we just need to eliminate the abnormal environmental factors causing the open bite. Hence, to obtain this vital information, uh, whether to uh, go for fixed orthodontic treatment or removable, or whether to go for uh, functional or non-functional, uh, we need to turn up to cephalometrics. 
so introduction for cephalometric uh, is uh, the cephalometric is itself a word which can be divided into two parts. Mm -hmm. Self means the head and metry means the measurement. Uh, cephalometry was mod modified from anthropometry and craniometry. Uh, craniometry is a study of dry skull and anthropometry is a study on living skulls. Uh, one that uh, and the uh, thing that we will take into consideration is a roentographic cephalometry, which is the measurement of the head from the shadow of bone and soft tissue landmarks on roentographic image. So history behind this cephalometry was the, the cephalometry was first were introduced by Broadband and Hofrath in the year uh, 1931, and its clinical applications was given by Down in the year 1942. So uh, what are the various heart tissue landmarks that will be uh, that will be uh, seen throughout the seminars? First is cella. Uh, cella is the midpoint of the hypophysis cerebri. Uh, next is nasion. Nasion is the anterior most part and the frontal nasal suture. Uh, articular is the inter uh, intersection between the temporal uh, bone and the uh, articular process of the mandible. Uh, condylion is the anterior most point on the head of the condyle. Uh, gonion is a constructed landmark. Uh, drawn by tangent through mandible uh, plane and the tangent to ramus. Uh, menton is the uh, deepest, uh, lowermost point on the symphysis, uh, whereas nation is uh, uh, again a constructed point uh, uh, on the uh, inferior most, uh, lower inferior most part of the chin. Hogonian is most prominent part of the chin. Uh, point A is the uh, point that is lies in the deepest concavity in the um, maxillary apical base. Whereas point B is the most posterior point in the mandibular apical base. ANS is anterior uh, nasal spine. PNS is formed by the intersection of uh, terego mandibular fossa and uh, uh, nasal floor. Whereas orbital is the lowermost point on the orbit. So what are the different cephalometric planes? Uh, first one is the Frankfurt horizontal plane passing through orbital and uh, orbit. A Selanesion plane, a palatal plane, occlusion plane and the mandibular plane. So before uh, moving ahead with the topic, uh, we should uh, understand in what, in which stage the of the growth for the child is. For that, I have referred to this article given by uh, Bashetti et al. The cervical vertebrae maturation method for the assessment of optimal treatment timing in dentofacial orthopedics. Uh, uh, these are the various CVMI staging uh, that is given. So what are the radio uh, radiographic cephalometrics? Uh, it is uh, divided into further heading that is facial skeleton, jaw bases, and dental villa analysis. The first one is analysis of the facial skeleton, uh, in which uh, the angular measurements and linear measurements, uh, which we'll be seeing, are the saddle angle, gonial angle, and articular angle. Whereas in linear measurements, we will see anterior facial height, posterior facial height, anterior cranial base length, and posterior cranial base length. So, first is the saddle angle. The landmarks for the saddle angles are nasion. Uh, to cella and cella to articular. The angle formed between these two uh, lines uh, is called a saddle angle. Uh, the saddle angle has an average value of 123 plus minus 5 degree. Uh, it suggests the relation between the anterior and posterior part of the cranial base. Uh, this uh, saddle angle, when it is large, uh, that means there is a posterior positioning of the mandible. And when the, there is mandible is posteriorly positioned, the condyle is also uh, is being held in the posterior position. Now, this uh, thing can be compensated by the change in the articular angle or the uh, in the length of the uh, ramus. Uh, if this thing is not compensated by the articular angle and the length of the ramus, then the functional appliance therapy in those cases is contraindicated. The next is articular angle. The landmarks for articular angle are cella, uh, articular, and gonion. The average uh, angle value is 143 plus minus 6 degrees. Uh, it gives the relation between upper and lower part of the posterior contours. So, uh, what uh, these articular angle size is depend on the position of the uh, mandible. If the mandible is placed uh, retrognathically, uh, this this, uh, this articular angle will tend to increase, and this will be ideal for the functional appliance case. Whereas, if the mandible is uh, placed ahead, this articular angle will uh, decrease, and that won't be ideal for the functional appliance case. So in what are the cases this uh, uh, articular angle will decrease when there is a forward positioning of the mandible, uh, like in prognathic cases, when we tend to close the bite, it uh, the articular angle uh, uh, decreases. And when there is a mesial migration of posterior teeth, 
then also the articular angle uh, decreases uh, and it increases when we tend to open the bite and then distal migration of the posterior teeth in uh, in a study of 9 year old child uh, we have seen that in horizontal group pattern uh, the articular angle is tend to on the lesser side compared to vertical growth pattern where the articular angle is uh, on the uh, greater side uh, moving to the next that is gonial angle uh, gonial angle the landmarks for the gonial angle includes articular gonion uh, and menton the average value for the uh, gonial angle is 128 degree plus minus 7 degree uh, it uh, it forms uh, it gives the uh, direction uh, of the growth of the uh, mandible how and this gonial angle is further divided uh, through a line from mesion to gonion into upper gonial angle and lower gonial angle the upper gonial angle uh, gives the obliqueness about of the ramus whereas lower gonial angle gives the slant of mandibular body uh, for uh, uh, orthopedic like in orthodontics lower uh, myofunctional cases uh, lower gonial angle is of much more importance than the upper gonial angle Uh, because when the uh, upper gonial angle tend to increase, there will be a, a forward position of the symphysis and hence the horizontal growth pattern. Whereas when lower gonial angle tend to increase, there will be the vertical growth pattern that is the downward inclination of the uh, mandible. And when suppose upper gonial angle is decreased, there will be less advancement of the mandible. And lower gonial angle when it decreases, there will be upward inclination again. So mean values for upper gonial and lower gonial are 52 to 55 degree and 72 to 75 degree respectively. So uh, in a nutshell, this gonial angle, when this gonial angle is acute, uh, there is specifically in the lower component, there will be the horizontal growth pattern and that will be favorable for the uh, myofunctional uh, treatment. Now some of the angles, when we combine all these three, that is the saddle, articular and the gonial angle, we get the sum of 394 degrees. When this uh, values uh, increases, that means there is a horizontal growth pattern, and that is again favorable. Uh, whereas uh, if this value decreases, uh, there is a vertical growth pattern, which will which won't be favorable. Now moving on the linear measurements, that is first is the facial height. So facial heights again can be divided into two: posterior facial height and anterior facial height. Posterior facial height uh, is starts from cella to gonion, whereas anterior facial height is from Nasion to menton, and these facial heights are checked when the teeth are in habitual occlusion. Now, growth increment in this facial height, the dark line uh, is the horizontal growth pattern line, uh, where the first we can see in the posterior facial height, uh, the horizontal growth pattern tend to grow on increasing uh, with advancement of age, whereas in uh, anterior facial height, uh, this uh, this is uh, opposite, like vice versa, that uh, compared to posterior facial height. The vertical growth pattern tend to uh, increases over a period of time. Now, uh, although there is different parameters hold its significance, but they have it more importance when they combine in the form of ratio. That is the Jarabek ratio. So, Jarabek ratio is uh, calculated by posterior facial height upon anterior facial height into 100. Uh, when this the normal range for this uh, Jarabek ratio is 62 to 65 degree, uh, but when it is more than a uh, 65. There will be horizontal growth pattern, and if it is less than 62, then there will be vertical growth pattern. Uh, more than 65 means either there will be the increasing uh, numerator or decrease in denominator. That means uh, there will be increasing the posterior facial height or decrease in the anterior facial height. That can lead to formation of horizontal growth pattern. So to sum up this facial height, if the anterior facial heights are increased and the posterior facial height is decreased, that means the numerator is decreasing. Uh, the Jarabek ratio will be less than uh, 62, and hence there will the growth pattern will be vertical, and the prognosis will be poor. Whereas when the anterior facial height decreases and posterior facial height increases, that means numerator is increasing and the denominator is decreasing. That means the growth pattern is horizontal. That is more than 65 degree of Jarabek uh, ratio. That means the prognosis is good. <laughs> Now cranial uh, base length. Uh, cranial base length uh, is calculated uh, is again divided into two parts: uh, anterior cranial base length and posterior cranial base length. So, anterior cranial uh, base length assesses the proportional length of maxillary and mandibular uh, bases. Uh, it is calculated from cella entrance to nasion. Uh, cella entrance is that landmark uh, which uh, comes on the intersection uh, at the midpoint of the anterior and posterior cranial process. So, in this parameter, cella entrance is taken and not cella is taken. 
and in the horizontal growth pattern this uh, anterior cranial base length tend to increase compared to post uh, in vertical growth pattern this uh, cranial base length tend to de decrease now posterior cranial base length is calculated as to articulate it dependent upon the posterior facial height and position of the fossa so it increases in again in the horizontal growth pattern and it decreases again in the vertical growth pattern the more the smaller the uh, this cranial base length are there will be more the increment in the growth process so this cranial uh, posterior cranial base length if it is short it can be due to of two causes it can be either of vertical growth pattern or it can be skeletal open mind which can ultimately lead to poor prognosis for functional appliance therapy so moving ahead with analysis of jaw bases it is further divided into three categories uh, first we will check the jaw bases in the vertical reference plane second in the horizontal reference plane and third just the linear measurements so in the vertical references plane we will see the sagittal relationship that is sn and snb in uh, horizontal reference plane we will see the base angles and inclination angles so sna angle sna angle is formed between uh, cella mesion and mesion to point a uh, it expresses the sagittal relationship of anterior limit of ma maxillary apical base to the anterior cranial base the mean value for sna is 82 degree uh, large sna uh, angles generally seen in class 2 d1 cases cases uh, in those cases, the functional appliance uh, therapy is contraindicated. According to the McNamara, SNA does not change much, uh, may, uh, much with the functional appliance treatment. So SNA angle, it tend to, uh, when this SNA in, uh, angle increases uh, uh, more than 82 degree, there is a prognathic maxilla and if it decreases from uh, 82 degree, there will be a retrognathic maxilla. Uh, SNB uh, expresses the sagittal relationship of anterior limit of mandibular apical base to anterior cranial base. Uh, it's again cella nasion to nasion to point B. The mean value is 80 degree. The small SNB angle uh, is for functional appliance therapy is indicated. The average angle and growth increment in the horizontal facial type is much uh, larger than those with vertical growth pattern at 9 years to 15 years of age. Uh, so again, if this angle increases, there will be a prognathic mandible. And if this value decreases, there will be a retrognathic mandible. Now, growth increments uh, in uh, from 9 years to 15 years in SNA, you can see there's a much, there's not much of the growth increment seen throughout the age changes. And it's a spiral kind of uh, increments kind of seen. Uh, whereas SNB, you can clearly uh, appreciate that the horizontal growth pattern tends, uh, over, uh, exceeds the vertical growth pattern. So what are the drawbacks for this SNA and uh, SNB? Because these angles are affected by the length of anterior cranial base and end point is not a stable landmark. In cases of vertical growth pattern, SNB angle may sh show smaller measurement. In such cases, uh, beta angle is uh, more useful as compared to SNB. Hence, to check for the beta angle, uh, it's the assess the skeletal, skeletal discrepancy again between the maxilla and mandible in the sagittal plane. The landmarks which we'll be using in this beta angle is point A, point B, and apparent axis of the condyle. A line is drawn joining the condyle and the point B, and point A to point B, and the perpendicular is drawn from point A on this condyle uh, to point B line. Uh, the average value for class 1 is 27 to 35. For class 2, it is less than 27, and for class 3, it is greater than 35. So next, uh, to assess the discrepancy, Next is the W angle. Uh, the landmarks for W angle are cella, uh, midpoint of pre maxilla that is uh, point M, and uh, point G is the uh, center of the uh, tangent contacting the lower symphysis. The uh, W angle uh, seen in class one measures about 51 to 56 degree, whereas it is less than 51 in class two cases and it is greater than 56 in class three cases. Uh, article uh, given by Ruchi Sharma et al. Comparison of the with comparing the W angle with different angular and linear measurements in assessment of sagittal skeletal relationship in class one and class two patient in Jaipur population, a cephalometric study. They concluded that the use of W angle can provide more accurate assessment of sagittal skeletal relationship, and other measurements such as width appraisal can be misleading for the assessment of anterior posterior discrepancy. 
uh, so moving ahead moving ahead with the topic that is the base plane angle that means in the horizontal reference plane uh, it expresses the angle uh, between the uh, maxillary and mandibular jaw bases uh, this angle is calculated between palatal plane that is from ans to uh, posterior nasal spine and the mandibular plane uh, it determine the inclination of the uh, mandible and the trend for this angle is more towards the horizontal growth pattern so when uh, this base plane angle decreases the average value is 25 degree but when this value decreases that means the uh, mandible will uh, come in the more horizontal growth pattern and when this value increases there will be the vertical growth relationship of the uh, mandible this base plane angle can be again divided into upper angle and lower angle uh, by the occlusal plane so uh, more importantly the lower angle uh, it studies the prognosis of the uh, in deep overbite uh, patients and if this uh, lower angle is larger more than that is more than 20 degree prognosis of opening the bite will be good but if this angle is less than 7 degree there will be a poor prognosis for opening the bite uh, moving ahead with inclination angle which is also called a j angle uh, this inclination angle is measured between the palatal plane and the uh, perpendicular drawn from the soft tissue nasion on this palatal plane uh, the uh, average value for inclination angle is 85 degree uh, it is not and it's one of the important finding that it is not uh, related with any of the growth pattern uh, when this uh, angle increases uh, there will be upward uh, inclination of the palatal plane and when this angle decreases there will be the anterior downward inclination of palatal plane mainly matrix rotation and intra matrix rotation uh, and why this is important uh, first we will see about intra matrix intra matrix rotation is uh, remodeling of the mandible in the symphysis and gonial area uh, when there is a apposition in the gonial and resorption in the symphysis area then that can lead to formation of horizontal growth pattern and uh, opposite to this that is the apposition in the symphysis area that means more deposition in the anterior region and resorption in the gonial area can uh, lead to formation of uh, vertical rotation of the mandible uh, there is this article published in american journal of orthodontics in 1985 by debets uh, on the puzzle of growth rotation where he explained intramatrix uh, intramatrix rotation with the help of picture uh, as you can see in that uh, picture that the frame the external frames remains the same but the inside photos its inclination changes every time similarly in intramatrix rotation when we coincide the mandible on uh, it against the posterior uh, reference line we can see that the external appearance is remains the same but the internal the carpus that tends to uh, uh, rotate around itself uh, that is nothing but the intramatrix rotation uh, whereas matrix rotation is the rotation of mandible in its neuromuscular envelope Uh, matrix rotation uh, matrix rotation occurs uh, with the center of the condyle whereas the center of intramatrix rotation is within the body of mandible as we have seen in that uh, previous image uh, the rotation of jaw bases uh, in cephalometric we will ultimately see the total rotation uh, the total rotation is 15 degree internal rotation from age 4 to adult life of uh, which 25% occurs through matrix rotation and 75% occurs through intramatrix rotation This is eleven to twelve degrees of backward rotation, uh, and three to four degree decrease in the mandibular plane angle from the external uh, is seen. Now, mutual relationship between maxilla and mandibular rotation, uh, because the rotation of uh, mandible is very decisive. If the mandible is rotating horizontally, it can cause the over uh, deep bite, and if the mandible is rotating uh, vertically, it can result in open bite. so uh, levran and gasson they came up with different uh, combination of rotation of uh, jaw bases the first one is when both the jaw bases converge together so when both the jaw bases converge together there will be uh, increasing severity of deep bite which is difficult to manage using functional uh, methods whereas in the second pattern uh, there is a divergent rotation of the jaw bases means both the jaw bases are going in opposite direction and that can result in formation of open bite in severe cases orthognathic surgery is required uh, the third uh, pattern they uh, observed is that the upward rotation of both upper and lower jaw uh, in this horizontal growth pattern there is relatively harmonious rotation of both jaws in upward and forward direction 
and the last one is the downward rotation of the both the jaw uh, downward rotation uh, of maxillary uh, because the mandible is rotating downwards the maxilla tends to offset so that the uh, formation of open point could be avoided so there are seven structural signs for extreme growth rotation given by bjork uh, first is inclination of the condylar head then the curving of the mandibular canal uh, then the shape of the lower border of the mandible in which the what in vertical growth pattern there is pronounced a position that is formation of bone below the symphysis of the anterior part and with uh, rounding with the thick cortex while the resorption occurs at the uh, angles produces a typical concavity whereas in horizontal cases there is no anterior rounding it just the angle is convex uh, uh, the next that is the inclination of symphysis uh, in vertical type symphysis sinks forward and the chin is prominent and in horizontal types uh, symphysis swing backwards and the chin is receding whereas uh, difference in the interincisal angle difference in the interpremolar inter and intermolar angles uh, compression or overdevelopment of uh, lower face uh, linear measurements of the uh, jaw bases uh, it's just not only the angles that are required for accurate cephalometric analysis it the length and the position of the jaw bases is equally important because the retrognathic mandible can be uh, due to uh, functionally shifted or it can be due to the small uh, length of the mandibular base so for this uh, we take the help of schwartz analysis uh, whether the where he compared uh, length of maxillary base length of mandibular bases and the ascending ramus with respect to the length of cella entrance to nasion so the ideal dimensions relative to cella entrance to nasion is calculated using three parameters that is uh, nasion to cella entrance to mandibular base ratio is 20 is to uh, 21 the ascending ramus to mandibular base ratio is 5 is to 7 the maxillary base to mandibular base ratio is 2 is to 3 now extent of mandibular base uh, this mandibular base is calculated from gonion to uh, pogonion and which is projected perpendicular on down onto the mandibular plane uh, up to the 12 years of age there is a 3 mm increment but after the 3 uh, uh, after the 12 year of age there is 3.5 mm increment in this uh, mandibular base the trend for the uh, uh, extent of this mandibular base is horizontal growth and is that and when the length increases the uh, more the horizontal growth uh, horizontal growth pattern achieves in the patient so uh, while evaluating this mandibular base uh, so if there's a retrognathic maxilla retrognathic maxilla uh, can be uh, due to either of short bases or it can be uh, retrognathic mandible it can be due to either of short base or long base uh, when there is a short base man, that means there is still a uh, scope for the future further development of the mandible hence the uh, growth uh, deficiency is there and hence the prognosis for the myofunctional appliances is good whereas uh, in retrognathic mandible when it comes to long bases uh, it can be uh, either due to functional retrusion or it can be due to morphogenetically in the posterior position so what does mean by functional retrusion functional retrusion is overclosure or due to the uh, disturbance in the occlusal guidance naturally the patient is closing uh, little more anterior to the what uh, little more anteriorly to this functional retrusion position but uh, eliminating that uh, cause for this can eliminate this thing uh, the second uh, uh, parameter that is the morphogenic uh, morphogenetically in the posterior position that means the condyle itself the mandible itself in the most uh, posterior direction and hence uh, that will create a poor prognosis in the case now extent of maxillary base uh, it is calculated from uh, posterior nasal spine to point a and is projected onto the palatal plane the growth increment uh, in the maxillary base is lower compared to that of uh, maxillary base uh, mandibular base length of the base and growth increments are, are higher in the again in the horizontal growth pattern now evaluation of this maxillary base the uh, maxillary base can be evaluated through two parameters First is the length of the mandibular base, and other is from distance from nasion to cella entrance. Uh, let's see the first part that is with the length of the mandibular base. When this uh, value deviates between mandibular base and the maxillary base, there is a tendency uh, that uh, there is a tendency of maxillary base can be either too long or too short. But if these values uh, do not deviate, there will be a proportionate facial skeleton. Whereas uh, uh, 
uh, maxillary base when uh, is when not related to distance from nasion to cella entrance uh, the facial skeleton will be proportionate but it can be uh, maxillary base will be too long or short because uh, it is in relation to cranium and we are not assessing the two jaws together uh, the length of the ascending ramus it is calculated from gonion to condylion uh, that is important for determining the posterior uh, facial and subsequent relationship to the anterior facial height it is again longer in horizontal growth pattern uh, too short in uh, uh, relation to other proportion then a large growth is uh, expected uh, from the length of ascending ramus uh, this condylion is marked by bisecting the fh plane uh, in this they the, they have taken true fh plane by taking the midpoint from uh, uh, soft tissue nasion to palatal plane uh, in the midpoint of the soft tissue nasion and their line drawn on the palatal plane they bisected that line and it uh, it was taken parallel to the uh, cella entrance and soft tissue nasion and thus they constructed a true uh, frankfurt horizontal plane the next is the uh, mandibular morphology uh, it can be orthognathic uh, facial type where the ramus and the body of the mandible is fully developed the width of the ascending ramus is equal to the width of the body of the uh, mandible. Coronite and co condylar process both are at the same level and symphysis are uh, well developed. So these are the features for orthognathic facial types. Whereas for prognathic facial types, carpus is well developed and it's wide in the molar area. Symphysis is wider in the sagittal plane. Uh, ramus is again wide and long uh, and the gonial angle is acute or small. Whereas in retrognathic, the carpus again will be a narrow, symphysis uh, will be narrow and long, uh, ramus will be again narrow and short, coronite process will be at the lower level than that compared to the condylar process, and the gonial angle will be obtuse and large. Uh, so next is the dental alveolar analysis, uh, where we uh, see the axial inclination of the uh, incisors. It is, uh, it is formed, the angle is checked, uh, by uh, taking the long axis of the incisor and the ascent plane and the posterior angle is measured from seventh year of life this angle tend to increase from 94 degrees to 100 degrees uh, in cases where uh, there is a incisor protrusion is present which is not ideal for functional appliance therapy uh, there's an, uh, for that we need to uh, retrocline this incisor if the space is available uh, then we can we, this can be achieved through removable appliance by usually by tipping and if the space is not available, then uh, we have to go for fixed uh, treatment or for the, any compensation. Uh, same with the uh, in lower incisors. Uh, this is the angle uh, formed between the long axis of lower incisor and the mandibular plane. The average values are 90 plus minus 3 degrees. Uh, from 6 to 12 years of life, there is 88 to 94 degrees increment to a straight face. And uh, this, if this angle is smaller or there's, uh, these incisors are lingually tipped, that means they are advantageous for functional appliance treatment because over the treatment duration, this in, uh, since the mandible will come forward, the inclination will get normal. Uh, the position of the incisors, that is being checked with the NPOG line. Uh, the maxillary incisors are 2 to 4 mm anterior to this NPOG line, whereas uh, lower incisors are 2 mm posterior to 2 mm anterior to this NPOG line. Uh, now, effective uh, evaluate. This is the uh, articles uh, published in Journal of Somatology in the year 2022. The evaluation of effects of removable functional orthodontic apparatus on the upper airway size by the cephalometric films. They concluded that the according uh, to their finding, it can be considered that it caused a change in the upper airway in that the growth of the mandible and its anterior positioning may have an effect on the realization of the change. That means these functional appliances, they have an effect on airway changes as well. For that, I have referred the McNamara analysis, uh, specifically the airway analysis part, where the uh, airway analysis is divided into two parts, upper pharynx and lower mm -hmm. pharynx analysis. In the upper pharynx analysis, uh, two points are considered uh, and the anterior part of soft palate is considered. The points are uh, the posterior outline on the soft palate and the closest point on the uh, uh, Posterior the outline of the soft palate and the closest point on the pharyngeal wall. The average uh, nasopharynx width is 15 to 20 millimeter. Uh, the width of 2 mm or less in this region may indicate airway impairment. Uh, whereas the lower pharynx uh, width is measured 
from the point of inter in intersection between the base of the tongue and inferior border of the mandible and the closest point on the posterior pharyngeal wall. The average measurement is 11 to 14 uh, millimeters and this length is independent of age. Uh, now to uh, take the account of the progress of the treatment, uh, there, was, there was this need for something superimposition analysis. For this, for evaluating the treatment changes that occurring during the functional appliance therapy, I have referred this article. Uh, it was published in the Journal of uh, American Journal of Orthodontics in the year 1984. A cephalometric analysis of skeletal and dental changes contributing to class 2 correction in activated treatment by Panchers. The aim uh, was uh, of this investigation to was to evaluate cephalometric the mechanism of anterior posterior occlusal changes in activated treatment. The analysis may, use made it possible to relate uh, alteration in the occlusion to sagittal, uh, skeletal, and dental changes in maxilla and mandible. Okay. For Pancher's analysis, uh, two, uh, three reference planes that have been considered. The first is uh, the nasion to cella, uh, that is the uh, horizontal plane. The other plane is the occlusion line. Now, here the occlusion line is a tangent drawn from the distobuccal cusp of maxillary first molar and bisecting the uh, incisal vertical overbite. And to this occlusion line, one perpendicular is drawn that is passing to the cella that is called as occlusion line perpendicular. So these three planes are considered in the Pancher's analysis while assessing the difference that occurred before and after the functional appliance therapy. So what are the uh, parameters that have been checked by Pancher's uh, in, its cephalo in his uh, cephalometric analysis? Uh, the first is to calculate overjet. Uh, IS is nothing but the uh, incisor tip of maxillary incisors, whereas II is incisor tip of mandibular incisors. Uh, where there is, wherever there is S, that means it is related to maxilla, and I is uh, related to mandible. So the first two parameters, that is overjet, which can be calculated by uh, uh, taking in the consideration that IS to occlusion line minus the uh, in lower incisor tip to the occlusion line. Uh, when we minus these two values, we can get the overjet. And the molar relation can be uh, assessed similarly. But the in molar uh, relationship, uh, they have taken the contact point of the molars, mesial contact point of the molars, mandibular first permanent molars. Uh, they, so to calculate the molar relationship, uh, MSOL, uh, which was minus from MI, MIOL, that means maxillary was minus from mandibular. And accordingly, the molar relation was calculated. If the values are positive, that means it indicates a distal relationship. And if it's a negative value, that means it is a normal relationship. And similarly, the other parameter, that is the anterior nasal spine, pogonion articular uh, was checked. So moving ahead again with the modified Pancher's analysis. This is an article again uh, published in the American Journal of Orthodontics in the year 2000. Uh, treatment timing for fin block given by Bashati et al. Uh, the difference between panchers and modified panchers is that the vertical reference plane is different. Here they have uh, taken the consideration of point T in the vertical reference plane. So what is this point T? Point T is uh, the superior uh, point of the anterior wall of cella. Uh, cella tersica at the junction with the tuberculum cellae and it's drawn tangent to the uh, lamina cribrosa of the ethmoid bone. This basic cranial, the concept behind this that this basic cranial structures, they uh, does not undergo remodeling after four to five years of age. Hence, they remain stable after the completion of growth. And they have taken this as most stable landmark compared to cella, which was used in original Pancher's analysis. Uh, so another parameters to assess the growth pattern is the y-axis analysis, which was seen in Downs, uh, which is up, which can be evaluated in Downs analysis. Uh, the y-axis analysis is taken between cellar and atheon and the FH plane. The mean value is 59.4. If this angle increases, that means there is a vertical growth pattern. Uh, then moving on to soft tissue analysis, uh, it gets aesthetic line. Uh, it's a tangent drawn from the tip of the nose and the anterior point of the chin. The upper lip should lie 2 to 3 mm posterior, whereas the lower lip should uh, lie 1 to 2 mm posterior to this rickets aesthetic line. Now, another soft tissue analysis is the Steiner's S line. It is a line joining soft tissue pogonion and a midpoint of S shaped curve between some nasal and the nasal tape. Normally, lips should fall on this line. 
uh, there is this article uh, published in the Angle Orthodontist in the year 2002, Cephalometric Determinants for Successful, uh, successful uh, Functional Appliance Therapy. Uh, they concluded that the, in the uh, patients that responded favorable to the treatment, the pre-treatment differences were found to be a smaller and more reclusive mandible and smaller anterior and posterior facial heights were seen. Uh, so moving ahead with clinical cases, just to uh, uh, discuss that uh, what are the parameters and how can we come to the selecting the proper appliance for the patient. This was uh, Ishan Dande of 14 years male came to our department with chief complaint of irregular placed upper and lower front teeth. Uh, on the uh, external profile on the lateral view, you can see there's a retrusive chin. Uh, on intraoral, there's a class 2 molar relationship uh, seen. On cephalometric analysis, there's a retrognathic mandible and class 2 condition. The growth pattern is average to vertical growth pattern in this case. Uh, the other factors, uh, there is effective mandible length is decreased. Jarabek ratio is increased. Uh, there's a procline upper and procline lower uh, incisors, protrusive upper and lower chin, and the lip strain is present. So the diagnosis for this case was the skeletal class 2 uh, pattern with orthognatic maxilla and retrognatic mandible with procline upper and lower anteriors and protrusive upper and lower lips. Uh, on diagnosis,